Hello everyone, welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are going to be talking about a viewer question I received on my LinkedIn. And that question relates to pin naming on some components, specifically with respect to ground pins. Now, if you look on some components, including microcontrollers, they may have some pins that are named ground analog or some variation of that. You may see things like AGND or VSSA, all inferring the presence of a separate analog ground plane. But is this really the way you should lay out your PCB? As we've talked about a lot of times on this channel, it probably is not the way you should lay out your PCB. So, how should you use these pins? We're gonna discuss that in this video. We're gonna look at some parts data sheets on Octopart, and we'll even look at some examples in Altium Designer. Let's get started. So as I mentioned in the introduction, sometimes if you look on some microcontrollers, you will see different names for different ground pins. This all came about from a viewer question that I received on my LinkedIn. Let's take a look. Wisnu Kusama writes, Hi Zach, I have a question. If the design of a microcontroller, it is good to have a single ground plane, why do a lot of big brand microcontrollers still put different ground for digital stuff and analog stuff on their products? See the attached picture, please. Thanks. Then he went ahead and showed this picture. Now, this picture is from an STM32 datasheet, and you can very clearly see that we have a couple different names for ground nets in this image. So what's the deal with the different pin naming? Well, let's go ahead and take a look. So let's just take a look at an example component, and this could really be anything. It could be a microcontroller, it could be an ADC, whatever. The point is, we have some pins here, Typically, this is gonna be VDD. This would be your uh, VSS. And then, let's say, for example, we have an analog interface. This is going to be our AVDD, and then our AVSS. Now, how do we use these? Well, if you just rewind and look at that STM32 datasheet image, you will see that VSS and AVSS are connected to the same net at some point. So they have the same ground symbol, and when you see that in the data sheet, if they don't have different ground naming, they are connected to the same net because they have the same symbol. What about these VDD pins? How are they being used? Well, there's really several ways to do this. Sometimes you will have a single supply, and that single supply will then supply, let's say for example, VIN to VDD. It could then also supply VIN directly to AVDD. What about decoupling? Well, again, as we saw in that STM32 image, we would have some decoupling here, and then we would also want to have decoupling here on these pins. This decoupling is ensuring that we have stable voltage being read between VDD and VSS. So remember, all voltages are measured between two points, and so these are the two points where you're measuring that voltage. Now, AVDD needs to do the same thing. It also needs to measure a voltage between these two pins, but AVDD's reference is AVSS. And so we wanna make sure that the voltage between these two pins is as stable as possible, and that is why it needs its own decoupling capacitor. What we wouldn't wanna do is take the risk that we try to just measure the voltage between AVDD and ground while just having this connected directly to ground like this. And the reason we do that is because we don't wanna incur any additional spreading inductance between this pin and this pin. That additional spreading inductance could slow down the power response of any of this capacitance, and then that could create an issue when this interface needs to draw power through this VDD pin. So instead of doing this, we just leave them connected to the same plane, but it gets its own decoupling. Now this analog voltage input could be supplied by, for example, an ultra low noise regulator, and that could be a totally different regulator from this V in. One thing I also see sometimes is you do have a single regulator, but then what somebody tries to do is basically take this V in and then split it off like this, and then they'll use something like a ferrite right here. So they'll have a ferrite bead right here to then try and isolate the analog interface from the digital interface. I've discussed many times why you might not want to do this. Again, we've done simulations on it as well, and we've shown that depending on the bandwidth of the signals being drawn into VDD and AVDD, this ferrite bead could create additional noise, especially at low frequencies, 
or it could create large spikes at very high frequencies. So this one I think is good to avoid unless you can prove that you need it. One strategy here when you're actually doing a prototype build is you could put a footprint for a ferrite bead, but instead of actually placing the bead, just place instead a zero ohm jumper. Then you can experiment with having a zero ohm jumper which just has a direct connect or with placement of the ferrite bead and really see which one gives you more precise results. Now it could be that for your particular application, maybe the ferrite bead does create some noise, but it doesn't violate the noise spec on your measurement. So that's something that you have to decide when you're actually working with your system. And it's again, something you should prove that you need rather than just using the ferrite bead outright in every single system that you build. This is our way to use all these different pins. Again, we have a digital section, an analog section, but at the end of the day, they're connected back to the same plane but they can have their own decoupling to ensure stable voltage. So now let's take a look at some components that actually use these different pin names and we can see what the best practices are for those types of components. So I have some components pulled up here on Octopart and let's go ahead and take a look at some of these components so we can see some different ground pin naming schemes and how they're actually used. First thing I wanna do is take a look at the component that was brought up by Wisnu in his question. That component was an STM32F4 series. So the STM32F4 datasheet is pulled up right here. You'll actually see this in more than one STM32 component. So just as an example, I have an STM32H7 pulled up right here. And if I just search for VSSA, you will see here that there is a pin named VSSA or VSS for an analog interface. Now you can see right here on pin L1 that we have the corresponding VDDA. So essentially any capacitance that you're going to use to decouple VSSA and VDDA, you wanna put across those two pins. You shouldn't be relying on capacitance somewhere else in the PCB layout. And that's essentially what we're gonna see when we look at some of these examples. But here you'll find that pin here on this STM32 as well as on the STM32F4 that you see here in this data sheet. So let's just jump right into some of these other parts. I have the ADS8557 IPM. This is a six channel ADC from Texas Instruments. Inside the data sheet, if you look at the pinout on this component, you can see here that we do have two different grounds. First, we do have analog ground pin listed right here on several of the pins in this pin diagram. So as you look around these three edges, you see an analog ground pin. But then you see this other pin here on the left side, BGND. And this is actually the first time I've ever seen a pin that was not intended to be an analog ground pin named B, G, and D. So I'm not quite sure what the B is supposed to be here. But the point here is that they do have two differently named pins uh, in this component. Now this component is not an isolated component. And in fact, if you just search isolation, the only thing you're gonna find is channel to channel isolation, but you won't find any galvanic isolation. And so because there's no galvanic isolation, all of these pins should be connected together on the PCB using a plane, just as you would expect. However, if we scroll down here and then we look for a layout example, you can start to see why we have those differently named pins this way and how they're actually being used. So here what they're showing is a little bit of bad guidance and a little bit of good guidance all in the same layout. First, we have a bad recommendation which is to have this notch in this plane and then this connection at one point. In reality, you don't need to do that when your signal that you are measuring in the analog interface is above the audio range. Once you get above the audio range, you really don't need to do that with the ground plane. You can just use a complete uniform ground plane. If you're measuring DC or very low signal frequencies, and you have to measure that input analog signal and you're having trouble controlling the return path, this notch strategy is one way to deal with it, but you can't route anything over that notch, then you'll have a radiated emissions problem. So that's one of those things you have to be careful with. More often than not, you just wanna use that single ground plane. But you can see here across the BGND and BVDD pins that we have a one microfarad capacitor. Similarly, across the other pins here in their layout example, they also put their capacitors very close across these AVDD and AGND pins. And they do that all the way around this component 
component. So that's a good thing to do. You want to put those capacitors for those specific pins directly on them, right next to the pins in the PCB layout. So what about that STM32? Would we want to do the same thing on the STM32? Well, I think the answer is actually yes, that's exactly what we would want to do because the STM32 has an analog interface built into it. And if you just look out here on this pin diagram, you can see the analog interface is right here on pins 19, 20, and 21. And so here you have your VSSA and VDDA, and you should decouple those two pins from each other using a capacitor. Don't rely on the capacitance to stabilize these pins from any capacitor that's connected, for example, up here across pins 10 and 11, you're gonna have way too much inductance. Put the capacitor directly across pins 19 and 21. Next, what about isolated components? Now, we've discussed isolated components in several other videos, and one of those isolated components could be, for example, an isolated ADC. So I've pulled up an isolated ADC from Renesis, and if we just go into the data sheet, you can see here that we do have, indeed, two different ground pins, just as we would expect for a galvanically isolated component. Now, in this case, you have two separate ground pins, but because the component has a galvanic isolation mechanism built into it, it has an isolation barrier, you would want to have those two pins disconnected from each other and on different ground planes. The two pins are on opposite sides of the component. So it's pin four and pin five right here in this pin diagram. The only time we're gonna connect those two pins is with a safety capacitor, and that would maintain the galvanic isolation that we need, and that's the entire reason we use this type of component. It's because we wanna have some sensing with an A to D converter, but we don't wanna have an issue with safety. We wanna maintain galvanic isolation, so we would use an isolated ADC. What about a buck converter? Well, there are isolated buck converter modules and boost converter modules. Here, this isolated DC-DC module has an isolation transformer built into it. And again, if you look at the pin diagram, it's a little difficult to see here, but if you zoom in, you do have two ground pins on opposite sides of this component. So that should be your cue that when you have the ground pins on this opposite sides of this component, you then have to have them disconnected. And you can see right here, the isolation barrier in the component runs right through the middle of the component. And then the two ground pins on either side of the component are then connected to totally different nets. Once again, this being an isolated system, the only time we would connect those two pins is with a safety capacitor that will help us maintain that galvanic isolation specification that we would want for this system with this component. But to summarize, if you have an isolated component, meaning it has a galvanic isolation specification and barrier built into it, then you, of course, always want to make sure that the grounds on each side of that isolation barrier are connected to physically different pieces of copper. Otherwise, you totally eliminate that isolation. If you have a standard non-isolated component, but it has different names for some of the ground pins, especially when there is an analog interface on that component, you still want to use a single ground net. And in fact, for many ADCs, those pins are actually connected to each other internally inside the component. So there are already a connection on that semiconductor die. There's no reason to have physically separate ground planes on your PCB. It's just gonna make your routing much more difficult. Instead, use a single plane to connect all the pins, but watch your capacitor placement. It's that capacitor placement for these different pin groups that you need to watch for, and make sure you put those capacitors for decoupling right next to those pin pairs on that component. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Of course, you can find me on LinkedIn or on YouTube and leave us some comments or questions. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah.